Thank you, uh, John Rico, for that kind introduction, and to Barb Spurrier and David Rosamond and Nick LaRusso for inviting me to be here today, and to uh, all of you for, for coming here. I also wanted to thank Jack, the patient that you saw, Jack McClure, uh, who will be available to talk at the break session. I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short time. As you mentioned, we've been doing this work for more than 30 years. And you know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug or a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive. And we often have a hard time believing that these simple choices that we make in our lives each day, like what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and perhaps most important, how much love and support we have, that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they often do. And in our studies, we use very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art measures to prove the power of these very low-tech and low-cost and often ancient interventions. But if you wanted to say, what is it that really ties together all of our work, it's, it's a simple question, which is, what is the cause of the problem? And if we just literally or figuratively bypass the problem without also addressing the underlying cause, then more often than not, the same problem, sorry, I'm trying to get this to work here, uh, that if we only address the uh, symptoms without also addressing the underlying causes, if we literally or figuratively bypass the problem without treating the cause, the same problem tends to come back again. I've been showing this slide for really a long time because it's as true now as it was when I started doing this work, that we spend so much time mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing without also turning off the faucet. And sometimes you do need to mop up the floor. But if we don't also treat the cause, the same problem often comes back again. The bypasses clog up, the angioplasties restenose, the medications have to be taken for a lifetime. But if we can treat the cause, what we're finding is that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing themselves, and much more quickly than we had once realized. And because these mechanisms are so dynamic, most people find that they feel so much better so quickly when they begin making these changes. It reframes the reason for making them from fear of dying, which is too scary, or risk factor reduction, which is too boring, to joy of living. And ultimately, it's joy and pleasure and freedom that make these kinds of lifestyle changes sustainable because you feel better. And there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy unless you get something back that's better and quickly. So, as jean Rico mentioned, we were able to show that even severe heart disease often can begin to reverse when people make these simple changes in diet and lifestyle. And we use quantitative arteriography and cardiac PET scans in the lifestyle heart trial, the two most definitive measures. In the upper left, you can see a narrowed artery, narrowing in the coronary artery where the arrow is. In the upper right, a year later, it's wider. And because blood flow is a fourth power function of the diameter, even small changes in the blockages can make disproportionate improvements in blood flow, which is what we measured in the PET scans before and after in the two pictures below. And blue and black is no perfusion. As you can see, there's a large part of the heart not getting any blood flow. And a year later, it's virtually normal. And clinically, this is a man who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting severe pain, was told he needed to have a heart transplant because his heart was pumping so, so poorly and was riding a wheelchair around Walmart. And within a few weeks, he was pain-free like most people. And within a year, he was measurably better and didn't need a heart transplant anymore. It's kind of the ultimate high-tech, low-tech juxtaposition. One of the interesting findings was that uh, people got better and better um, from beginning to one year to five years in the group that made these changes, whereas the randomized control group showed some worsening in their arterial blockages after one year and even more blockages after five years than after one year. You know, I thought the younger patients with milder disease would be more likely to show improvement, but I was wrong. It wasn't so much a function of how old or how sick people were, it was primarily a function of how much they changed. And we found this in the prostate cancer studies as, work. And that, as well. And that's a very empowering and hopeful message to give people, that the more you change, the better you feel, and the more you can improve in ways that we can actually measure. Uh, I got this as a Christmas card a few years ago from two of the men in one of the hospitals that we trained. The younger brother on the left is 86 and the older one is 92. They wanted to show me how much more flexible they were after doing their yoga. And the following year they sent me this one, so you just never know <laughs> how much better people can get. We found a 40% reduction in their bad or so-called LDL cholesterol, which is comparable to what you get with statin drugs like Lipitor, which we spent $20 billion on last year just in the U.S., without the costs and the potential side effects of those drugs. We then did a randomized trial looking to see if this could affect the progression of early stage prostate cancer, which we did in collaboration with Dr. Peter Carroll, the chair of urology at UCSF, and the late Dr. Bill Fair, who was the chair of urology at Sloan Kettering in New York. 
And we took men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer and who had elected for reasons unrelated to our study not to have conventional treatment, patients like Jack. And we uh, then randomly divided them into two groups. And, the, and this, from an experimental design standpoint, was good because then we could effect, as, evaluate the effects of intensive lifestyle, uh, intensive lifestyle changes alone without being confounded by chemo and radiation and surgery. And what we found is that after just a year, none of the experimental group patients needed treatment, but six of the control group patients did. PSA levels rose or got worse in the control group, but went down or got better in the experimental group. And those differences were significant. They're not huge, but in prostate cancer, if the PSA isn't rising, chances are the cancer isn't spreading, and you're more likely to die with cancer than from it. We also found that, again, the more people changed, the lower their PSA levels went in the same kind of dose response effect across both groups. We also were wondered, well, maybe we're just affecting PSA levels, but we're not actually affecting the prostate cancer. And when we added a their serum to a standard line of prostate tumor cells growing in tissue culture, we found that the in tumor growth was inhibited 70% in the group that made these changes, but only 9% in the control group. And to me, one of the most interesting slides was we found that that same kind of dose-response relationship was shown there as well. The more people change their lifestyle, the more it directly inhibited the growth of their prostate tumor cells in tissue culture, which I thought was pretty amazing. In a subgroup of patients, we did MRI and MR spectroscopy to look at the tumor activity, which is shown in red. And you can see in this patient that the activity diminished as well as the PSA level coming down. Well, we wondered, how is it that people can improve so quickly? Uh, what are some of the mechanisms behind that? And so we looked at their gene expression, and we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, in effect, turning on or upregulating the disease-preventing genes and downregulating or turning off the genes that tend to promote oxidative stress and inflammation that can lead to heart disease and cancer and the oncogenes that control breast cancer and prostate cancer. Now, I don't know, you can't see that all that well, but on the left are the um, genes that are mostly turned on and then on the right, you can see they're green. They go from red to green, which is mostly turned off. Each one of those is a, is a gene. And it just shows overall what a powerful difference these simple changes can make. We also found that when we looked at the RAS oncogenes that promote breast and prostate cancer, that in every gene we could identify, it was downregulated. So you can see it's mostly red or turned on in the before, and three months later, it's mostly green or turned off. We also looked at their telomerase levels with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn who, as Gianrico mentioned, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for her discovery of telomerase. And telomerase, as most of you know, is an enzyme that repairs and lengthens damaged telomeres, which are the ends of our chromosomes that control aging. As our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter. And she had done a study where she found that women who were under chronic emotional stress had shorter telomeres. Interestingly, it was the perception of stress rather than an objective measure. If you felt stressed, you were stressed. And it was the first study showing that there might actually be a genetic basis why chronic stress may shorten your lifespan. So, you know, we wondered, well, most things in biology could go both ways. So if bad things can make your telomeres shorter, maybe changing lifestyle in good ways can make them longer. And sure enough, we found that after only three months, telomerase and thus telomere length increased by almost 30%. And we published that in the Lancet Oncology. And even drugs haven't been shown to do that. So lifestyle changes can not only work as well as drugs and surgery, but oftentimes even better at a fraction of the cost. And the only side effects are good ones. So our genes are our predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. Now, from a health policy standpoint and from a business standpoint, these studies and others like them have implications because three quarters of the $2.5 trillion in healthcare costs, what Senator Harkin refers to as sick care costs, which is more accurate, are due to chronic diseases like these, most of which can be largely prevented or often even reversed by simply making changes in diet and lifestyle. And so I was doing some, a lot of work with the Obama administration on health reform because I was trying to say lifestyle can not just be prevention, and we get into these debates with the Congressional Budget Office like, well, a lifestyle always costs money because prevention makes people live longer and therefore it'll be more expensive, like that's a bad thing. Uh, but as treatment, clearly lifestyle saves money because it's so much less expensive. But the cartoon says I can operate or you can go on a strict diet and the, surgeon says, the, the patient says, well, you better operate because my insurance doesn't cover a strict diet and that's been the problem. And so it helped me understand that it's, we could do a thousand studies with a million patients, but if we didn't change reimbursement, it would always remain on the fringes. And nowhere is that clearer than in cardiology, where heart and blood vessel diseases still kill more Americans than now in most of the world, as other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us and die like us. Uh, we're exporting our chronic diseases around the world now. Then virtually everything else combined. 
Now, what's interesting is that Salim Youssef did a study of over 30,000 men and women, and he found that if we simply had people change their lifestyle, even more moderately than what we're talking about for reversing disease, that almost 95% of heart disease is completely preventable. I mean, think about it. We have the disease that kills more people than virtually everything else combined, and it's largely completely preventable today. We don't need a, a new breakthrough, a new, a new high-tech device. We just need to put into practice these simple low-tech changes. But how do we treat heart disease? Well, we use it mainly with drugs and surgery, and particularly with angioplasties and bypass surgery. Last year, we, or 2006, we spent $60 billion on angioplasties and stents, another $40 billion on bypass surgery. And the randomized trial, trials show quite clearly that unless you're the 1% or 2% of people who have the most severe heart disease, what's called left main disease and poor left ventricular function, that bypass surgery doesn't prolong life or prevent heart attacks. Uh, and the, in the New England Journal of Medicine published a study a couple of years ago called the COURAGE trial. It was a $40 million randomized large-scale trial. And their conclusion was that angioplasties and stents don't, prolong heart, don't prevent heart attacks and don't prolong life either. Now, if we were really practicing evidence-based medicine, you would think that the rate of angioplasties would be falling dramatically. The only subgroup of people that it may help is people who are in the middle of having a heart attack, but at least 98% of people who get angioplasties aren't in that subgroup. And so we're not really practicing evidence-based medicine. It's more reimbursement-driven. And it's not because we doctors are only interested in, in, in reimbursement, but if you're trained to use drugs and surgery, and if you're reimbursed only for using drugs and surgery, then use drugs and surgery. It's like the famous quote from Abraham Maslow, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see everything as a nail. And so it was important for us to change reimbursement to provide new options both for physicians as well as for patients. And that's why I applaud the work that the Center for Health Transformation is doing for looking at new paradigms that aren't simply drugs and surgery. And again, drugs and surgery can be life-saving in a crisis. But if we don't treat the underlying cause, what are patients told? Take these, take these statin drugs forever. Take these blood pressure pills. How long do I have to take them? Forever. Mop up the floor. How long do I have to mop up the floor? Forever. Well, why don't we just turn off the faucet, and then we find that the need for drugs and surgery is often greatly reduced. Now, we've done three demonstration projects to look at both the scalability of these kinds of approaches as well as the cost effectiveness. The first one was with Mutual of Omaha, and, we've, and the second one was Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, and the third one was with Medicare. And we had data on thousands of patients, and we've, I didn't know if people in Omaha or Des Moines or Columbia, South Carolina, where they told me uh, gravies of beverage, would be able to make these kinds of changes, but they did, and they did as well as anyone else. And Mutual of Omaha, we did a random, a, 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 match control study where we took men and women who were told they needed a bypass or angioplasty, offered them lifestyle as a direct alternative, and they found that most patients were able to avoid the surgery, and they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year because it's so much cheaper to teach people how to change their lifestyle than to operate on them, not to mention not having to have your chest cut open. Um, Heimreich Blue Cross Blue Shield was one of the insurance companies that was providing the program, and they had such good outcomes they began to, uh, they were covering it, they began to provide it in uh, several sites. And they did a match control study, and they looked at overall health care costs, and they found that they were comparable at baseline, but after a year, they were down by 50% in the experimental group who made these intensive lifestyle changes. Not just cardiac costs, but all costs. And they were down by an additional 20 to 30% in the years two and three. So these approaches are not only medically effective, but also cost effective. And I'm pleased to report that after 16 years of going back and forth with Medicare, uh, they are now covering uh, this program for reversing heart disease. I'm hopeful that they'll expand it to include type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and ultimately other chronic diseases as well. It's always hardest at first. But just to give you an idea of how hard it is to challenge a, a paradigm, I remember 10 or 11 years ago, I was talking with the then head of Medicare who almost weighed 300 pounds in chain smoke um, about doing a demonstration project. And he said, well, we'll do a demonstration project, but you have to get a letter from the head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health saying that it's safe for older people to walk, meditate, eat vegetables, and quit smoking, <laughs> which we did. You know, I mean, it's at that level. It really is held to a, a different standard. But if we change reimbursement, then we change medical practice and even medical education. And just to give you a gestalt of the data that we, we presented to Medicare when we were doing our uh, Medicare Coverage Advisory Commission hearing and national coverage determinations, we also published a paper a few months ago in the American Journal of Health Promotion on an additional 3,000 patients, which showed very similar outcomes. But beginning 12 weeks, one year, you can see there's a continued weight loss of almost 20 pounds. Uh, angina falls, falls strikingly, which again is what makes it so sustainable. You know, the old joke, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I make these changes? The quality of life actually improved uh, dramatically, uh, as well as their functional capacity. 
uh, and uh, significant reductions both in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. These are comparable and for many people can obviate the need for being on antihypertensive medications. Most of these patients were able to reduce or discontinue these drugs. And likewise, with diabetes, we're able to reduce or get people off of their diabetes medications. And that's important because the latest studies are showing that tight control of diabetes with drugs doesn't seem to reduce the incidence of complications, the eye, nerve, kidney damage, heart disease, impotence, and so on, whereas doing it with lifestyle clearly does. And so here again, lifestyle can not only be more cost effective, but also more medically effective. Now, there are health policy implications for corporations, and since this is a session on business, it's worth noting that healthcare costs are really reaching a tipping point in many companies. Uh, Starbucks spends more on healthcare for their employees than they do for coffee beans. General Motors more for healthcare than for steel. Mars Candy more for healthcare than for sugar. And so it used to be relegated to the human resources, but now it's at the CEO level because uh, it's affecting the bottom line. And I also began working with some of these companies because they realized that there are opportunities there. So I was able to consult with McDonald's and that led to the introduction of salads on the menus and uh, taking out the trans fats and the french fries. I mean, even incremental change on that level is not only good for the country, but it's also good business for them because of that first salad that we introduced, the fruit and walnut salad. McDonald's is now the biggest purchaser of apples in the world. They can do a lot more, but it's a good start. Uh, and with uh, Safeway, I was, uh, uh, contacted by uh, uh, Steve Bird, their CEO, five years ago. They were spending 120% uh, uh, of their net revenues on healthcare for their employees, which is clearly not sustainable. They began to implement some of these approaches at the workplace, and their healthcare costs came down 11% in the first year, and they've remained essentially flat since then. The last thing I want to talk about is the real epidemic isn't just heart disease or cancer, it's loneliness and depression and isolation. And study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are many times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. In part because you're more likely to smoke and overeat and drink too much and work too hard. In part through mechanisms we don't fully understand. One study showed that the more people felt loved and supported, the less blockage they had in their arteries. When you're depressed, your immune system is depressed in all the ways that we can measure. Uh, one study showed that men and women who were HIV positive who were depressed had more than double the likelihood of developing AIDS and dying than those who weren't. And so, and, and one study showed that support groups by David Spiegel and women with metastatic breast cancer could double the length of survival compared to those who didn't have that. Now a skeptic might say, come on, give me a break. I mean, talking about my feelings in a group is somehow going to help me live longer if I've got breast cancer or prostate cancer? And the answer is yes, because anything that promotes intimacy is healing. Anything that connects us is healing. There's a real breakdown in the social networks that used to give us that sense of connection and community. And when we don't have that, our risk of premature death increases dramatically. And so as Jack McClure said in the video, uh, he said having prostate cancer was the best thing that ever happened to him. And what he means by that is that so many people say things like that, or having a heart attack, or having whatever. Not that we diminish the, the, the importance of having a chronic disease, but it gets our attention. And if we can work with people at a time when they're open, we can help them develop approaches and help them understand the, the, the value of the spiritual and secular things that go through all the world's, world's great spiritual traditions, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy of altruism, forgiveness, compassion, and love for oneself and others, so that we can use the experience of, of illness or suffering as a catalyst for transforming our lives. This is a conference on transformation as well as transforming our businesses and transforming our system of healthcare to make it true healthcare and not just sick care. And when we look at it in that way, we can really regain our roots as healers and not simply as technicians by helping people use the experience of suffering as a catalyst for really transforming their lives, for using the stress management techniques to rediscover inner sources of peace and joy and well-being, to have the sense of connection and community that can really help transform people's lives. And so I appreciate so much the chance to be here today, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you.